Before we start talking about copyright law, I just want to make a couple notes here. One, uh, this is where if you are going to use the book, I mean, it's free. There's a PDF file or you can pay a few bucks for, I think it's less than $20 on Amazon. It is, it's a quite a large book, but we're not covering everything that's in it. The book tends to have a lot more cases and cases involving software that I think are kind of dense and tedious and I think this class would be more uh, fun and educational if we use just our, our movies, our television, our, our music and photographs and things that you are probably using with your classwork or you know outside for your, your, pro your individual projects. Um, certainly if you have any specific questions regarding software and I mean I'll, I'll put it in where necessary but I'm not going to go into a big case where we're talking about uh, that kind of technology. Uh, so point one, this is where we're going to switch into the book. If you look at the syllabus, I note it, I note like the page sections, like in groups, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that's the exact page you're going to find what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about in my slides and my discussions, you're going to find in the book. Um, but the book has a lot more information. The next topic is subject matter. And I think if you look at the page numbers I've given you, you're like, whoa, it's like 150 pages. It's condensed and broken down. You're going to have to look for the little bits and pieces. But if you use the index, you'll be able to go right to where we're, we're talking about. And um, they do have a, a chapter on the introduction and history of copyrights. I've also made a link to the United States Copyright Office under this section that has a, a history of copyrights as well that um, you should take a look at that will supplement the materials that we're, we're about to talk about. So the introduction to copyright law. Basically, it creates a system of property for intangible property uh, called works of authorship. This is the system for this kind of intangible property. We're not talking about inventions. We're not talking about uh, trade secrets. We're not talking about those symbols and slogans. And we're not talking about an individual's personal rights to um, economic rights to their likeness. We are talking about creations, works of authorship, things that are created. And in the broadest sense, copyright law creates a, a system of these property rights for intangible property that we've I've just said, works of authorship. It was initiated in the 18th century in England. The first Copyright Act gave authors the exclusive right to make copies of their books. And that's it, copies of their books. Today, copyright law covers a much broader ground. The law today goes much further than just protecting works against copying in the strictest set sense. Like if I took a book and put it on a copy machine, I'm making a copy in the strictest sense. But um, you're gonna see as we move forward, uh, these copyright laws also protect performance performing rights. If we're talking about a song, if you are the writer, uh, creator of a song, you can go out and perform it. You have those rights and you can restrict people from doing that. You have distri distribution rights where you can sell it, give it away, lease it, do whatever you want with your work. And there's derivative rights or adaptations. You know, the Harry Potter book became a movie. It's a derivative. So there's a whole bunch of rights that are um, involved in, in copyrights. Uh, the information industries are critical, as you can imagine, critical to today's economy. And I'm going to give you some numbers that I think will just blow you away when we're talking about copyrights and licensing and the importance of, you know, infringement or, or piracy. In 2007, the copyright industry, which encompassed, this number encompasses pre-recorded music, motion pictures, home videos, books, periodicals, newspapers, and computer software accounted for 6.85% 6 6 of the U.S. gross domestic products, which equals like in dollars, $1.3 trillion. That's how much, just in the U.S., that's just U.S. sales. The total company, the total uh, copyright industry employs 5.7 million people, which is 8.3% of the U.S. workers, which is, to put it in the context, equal to a combination of the healthcare industry, social security sector, and the manufacturing sector put together. Uh, so this is this is a big industry. How about uh, <clears throat> overseas? Overseas sales, 
These numbers, by the way, the last numbers I've seen, they're from 2017, if I didn't say that. Uh, copyright industry overseas in foreign sales, $191.2 billion, almost, two, almost $200 billion in uh, overseas sales, which is, to put it in the context, a more than the combined uh, areas of aerospace aerospace, agriculture, food, and pharmaceuticals. So that's a big number. And <clears throat> this is continuing to grow <clears throat> because of technology advancements. So let's jump in and look at the history, the historical overview. So the development of the law has been continuing, uh, is the result of continuing responses to challenges posed by new technology. Right, that reproduce and distribute these human expressions or creative works. Since the late 19th century, for example, copyright in the US uh, has seen changes in photography. Right? We went from film to digital. Motion pictures have changed. Sound recordings have changed. Technology is fastly changing, changing and it's relentless. Um, What's our biggest what's our biggest debate? The internet, digital networks, streaming, how fast we can copy and get something from point A to point B and not lose any quality. Um, going back to the going back in time history. So what was it? The first reaction to new technology. What do you think it was? It's a connection between technology and change and copyright, right? It was, it's what brought about the first copyright statue, 15th century, 1476. We had the printing press that was created by William Caxton. And what did the printing press allow? It allowed large-scale reproduction of books for the first time. That's huge. And unfortunately, at that time, that enriched publishers and booksellers not the authors necessarily. But the British Crown did not like that idea, so they passed a law in 1543. Publishing without a license is a criminal offense. And in 1557, they kind of gave a monopoly to this company called the Stationers, um, Stationers Company, which was the only publisher in town. They did all of the Crown's work. That's where you had to go. So basically they were trying to censor. They weren't going to allow you to publish anything without having it be reviewed by the by the government. And after a lot of lobbying efforts, the first Copyright Act was passed in 1710 called the Statue of Anne. And what that says is the encouragement of learned men to compose and write useful works. They were granted protection from uh, copying. So this was the encouragement of learned men to compose and write useful works. What this did was it switched from publishers uh, and booksellers to the author. The author now had their right and the definition for copying was very literal. It's basically what we would understand it to be, that as being the, um, they have the ability to allow for the sale, liberty of printing and reprinting of their book. That's it, pretty straightforward. There wasn't this derivative and performance and, and so forth. And the infringement incurred when we had a third party who printed or reprinted. That's it, you took the book and made a copy. And that was the only recourse they had. For the author. And this actually became the model for the United States uh, in creating the copyright statue which came prior to the prior to the Constitution. The American colonies each had their own laws regarding copyrights and the states continued to have their own laws relative to copyrights and I'll tell you where that kind of ends as we work through this timeline here. 
So the Founding Fathers creates the Constitution in 1787. They have Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8, which empowers Congress to legislate, legislate copyright statutes. And I already showed you the, the issue early on to promote the progress of science and the useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right that should be right. Of course, tight is kind of funny exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. So that gave the Congress the power to create laws regarding copyrights, which they did in 1790 was our first act that was passed. And it gave protection to the author or his assigns, meaning those who pass or who he gives that right to. Okay. If his rights passed to somebody and those who he expressly gives the right to as signs. They don't use licensing back then. It's a signs of three things, maps, charts, and books. That's what it was. That's what it covered. Maps, charts, and books for two 14 year terms. So when you first registered, cause registration was required. You had to register with the federal government. Uh, once you registered, you have 14 years and on the <clears throat> close of that 14 years, you got to renew it for 14 years. And on, this was only for Americans. You see some problems with that? Only American authors. This allowed publishers in America to pirate those popular British works, such as Charles Dickens. His works were pirated uh, from the United States or in the United States, I should say. And in 1891, however, some changes were made that allowed for protections to foreign, to foreign authors. But technology continued to change. And with that, the Industrial Revolution and such, the Copyright Act had to change. And in 1905, President Theodore Roosevelt called for a complete revision of the copyright law to meet modern conditions. And what changed was the act of 1909. And what happened was it included all writings of an author, not just maps, charts, and books. So they used the word writings, but that at that point it allowed for drawings and paintings and other such works. It was a very, it was a very, it opened it up and made it broad to include um, more works than just a specified three. And they also changed the duration. You get two 28 year terms from the moment you are published. So your first 28 years starts to tick the moment you publish and then you get a 20 year renewal. So that begs the question, what if you don't publish? There was no registration required anymore. They got rid of that, but you had to publish. So back in, let's say 1910, if you wrote a book and you just stuck it in your desk drawer or under, you know, uh, under the floorboard of your bedroom and it never got published, you, you don't have copyright protection. Someone else could, oh, what's this over here? This looks really good and take it and publish it. Once it's published, that's when the protection kicks in. And that's when the duration starts under this act in 1909. And this stayed in place for 68 years. That's a long time. This stayed in place for 68 years and the law, the law worked with it. Um, until the enactment of copyright the Copyright Act of 1976, which is our current law, our current body of copyright law. And what happened here was that, there's some big changes here. It ended the dual state and federal system. So at this point, copyright law becomes strictly a federal, a federal law. They call that, it's preempts, it preempts the state common law is the fancy terminology for it. But that does not mean that anything created prior to 1976 or this act going into effect doesn't have some rights under the states. Now, what I mean by that, there is a lot of recent cases and we're going to talk about it. 
especially involving music, and that's probably where we're going to talk about it, is songs from the 60s. Think about songs from the 60s. They're not protected. They weren't protected under federal. The sound recordings weren't protected under uh, the Copyright Act. So people thought that, hey, they're not protected under the Copyright Act. They're not protected. But they had protections through the states. And a lot of um, artists from the 60s brought state actions. Um, the case, is, <laughs> see if I can remember his, uh, remember his name, uh, Farrell. Uh, oh, I'm stumped. I'm, it might come to me to the end, but there was a recent case involving a 60s song. I want to say, um, no, still, still gone. I'm going to post it. I'll post it. It'll come to me after this is all over, and, and I'll post it. It's a song we're going to talk. It's a case we're going to talk about when we get to music and sound recording. Um, is it Will Ferrell? No. Ferrell, who's? Uh, nope. Done. You can laugh. I'm too old. Old school. Uh, but songs from the '60s, I've uh, it's come up. It's come up. It's actually come up in the in the classroom uh, at SUNY with regards to folks wanting to use uh, songs from the the '60s that are still protected, and students don't think it's they they are. But uh, we will talk further about that. We'll talk about the case that is freezing me up at the moment. Uh, it was a big money payout, too. So, the other changes that this made. Not only does the feds trump the states now, moving forward, it also re indicated that it will protect all works, all works that are fixed in a tangible medium. No publication required, no registration required. If you wrote a book and you wrote it in your journal, it's fixed in the tangible, tangible meaning, meaning it's down on paper. Your copyright starts right then. Your copyright starts to roll right then. You're protected right then and there. The duration changed at this point. It's the life of the author plus 50 years. Uh, it's 75 years from publication or 100 years from creation, whichever is less. If, the work, if it's a, what's called a work for hire or an anonymous author or an author that works under a different name or a pen name. We'll talk more about duration and do the calculations here. I'm just pointing out that the act has changed the duration, made it longer. And it also made specific categories of subject matter that's protected under the act. And there are several categories and we'll go through the categories and we'll list some examples. Uh, and it also, set forth what the exclusive rights are that each owner has relative to their rights. So this is what creates the, the right to sell, the right to reproduce, uh, the right to dis well distribute would be for sale, uh, to adapt, to make adaptations or derivatives and so forth. So there's a, a litany of rights relative to copyrights as well. So this became a very big body of law and then in 1998, Sonny Bono copyright term extension happened, which extended the duration by 20 years. And there was a lot of um, controversy over this move. Um, a lot of suggestion that it was driven by lobbyists, i.e. Disney, because Mickey Mouse was about to expire. And we'll talk about that history when we talk about duration. We're also going to talk about the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which was passed with regards to protecting uh, digital, uh, the digital uh, creations of works and even the passing and moving and sharing of works already created through the digital technology. So that's that comes under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act that we'll talk about in detail. And then amongst all of this stuff that is happening and going on, the Berne Convention gets created. And this is an international copyright convention that is made up of all the countries in the world. And the point is to try and have unity 
in the IP world, the intellectual property world, and it doesn't just mean copyrights. It also considers uh, patents and trademarks as well under the umbrella, but it's primarily for copyrights. It's been around since 1966, but the U.S. did not enter the convention until 1988. Um, at that point, apparently, America seemed to think it was important with world trade and the piracy of American works in certain foreign countries that they needed to have a say in the development of the international copyright policy. And we'll talk a little bit about the Berne Convention. And the, what we're, oh, and the other thing that was passed, I don't have a slide for it because it was fairly, well, it's not fairly newly passed, but I forgot. I'm just going to, I'm going to admit, I forgot to make a, a slide for it. President Trump passed a uh, executive order in 2018 extending the copyright duration yet again. So we'll talk about that order. So this is the framework of the 1976 statue, and this is what we are going to cover in this class. These, this, as we move forward, our next topic is going to be the subject matter. What is the subject matter of uh, the copyright laws? What is entitled to copyright protection? And that's going to be a big, big topic. It's probably going to cover, oh, at least three weeks. And then we're going to talk about owner's rights. Uh, what constitutes ownership? Uh, we're going to talk about the, I should say, the ownership, the owner's rights are those rights of derivative rights and um, the sale rights, distribution rights, and the reproduction uh rights of works. We're going to talk about those. We're going to talk about the formalities. Do you have to register? Why do you have to register? Do you have to put a copyright notice on your work? Things like that. We're going to talk about various uh, transactions. Hopefully get to, I'm not sure if we'll get to, that's kind of be towards the end, licensing transactions. We're definitely going to talk about durations of these copyrights because now with all of these changes, uh, it's hard to decipher what went into the public domain and what isn't in the domain public domain. We're going to talk extensively about fair use and the limits on copyrights. When can you use other people's works uh, without their permission? And we're going to talk about infringement or litigation, what constitutes copyright infringement. So we are going to cover all of those and a little bit more. We're going to talk about the future of copyrights and the challenges that the digital age is bringing on because the law is very uh, slow to, at catching up. It takes a long time for a case to get from beginning to end after it starts in the lower court and gets through the appeals process. We're talking it could be years or decades uh, depending on what we're what kind of case it is. So we can go from the printing press to the internet and it's certainly hard for the law to keep up so quickly. There's going to be a couple cases uh, that we're going to talk about that have taken like a decade to end and the courts made a, a very big ruling because they, they have to decide, are we going to follow this old law precedent? Are we going to uh, modify it? Or are we just going to overrule it and make something completely different? So anyhow, the other if, issue is where, think about how you get your information now. It's certainly different how I got it when I was a college student. How do you get your books? I just told you this book's available by a PDF. You don't even have to crack a book, right? We got Kindles. How do we get our music? I, I have some CDs lying around here, but that's not where I get my music anymore. Movies? There's no such thing as a video store. You just pop on, you know, Netflix or Redbox On Demand. Photographs? I haven't taken a picture or printed out a picture in who knows how long. You guys probably have never printed out a picture, huh? Um, but I have a box full of actual pictures that were taken on film. But think about how these have changed. It's like we don't touch them anymore. So is the fixed in a tangible medium going to change? We'll see. We'll see what happens next. The other thing we're going to talk about is social media. You put your protected work on Facebook Instagram, Twitter, whatever your favorite social media outlet is, do you think it's safe? Do you think it's free from piracy? Do you think those outlets can share your 
your works, your, let's say it's a photograph. There are a few cases we are going to discuss. One is about a man who trolls Instagram and takes the photographs off of Instagram and slightly modifies them and sells them in New York City for like $90,000 a piece. Big lawsuit. New York State. The recent Instagram case was a lawsuit uh, where Instagram, it was Instagram granting permission to, of a news agency to use one of its users' photographs without the permission of the actual user. And the court said that was okay per the terms and conditions of what you sign up for for Instagram. So we're going to talk about all those things. And I can't wait to, I mean, I've already started, very excited about starting. Copyright's a great topic and hopefully you guys are excited too. And the next week we will start the subject matter.